is there any other uniqueness that you know about of you know of the DWI laws in New York and or New Jersey in the particular counties or cities you serve? Well, every single county in in uh, New York, you know, you divide the five boroughs up. Every single borough has their own policy. You know, New York County's policies on uh, plea bargaining might be different or is different from the ones in Queens. Uh, the policy uh, in, in the Bronx, if you have a DWI and you were in an accident, plea bargaining purposes, is going to be different from what the policy will be in Kings County out in Brooklyn. Okay. So those policies are important to understand by the attorney when they're speaking to the prosecutor to try and get a favorable um, disposition or favorable plea for their client. And those things are very unique to the county. Okay. As far as um, New Jersey, every municipality, and there are over 70 municipalities just in Burton County alone, wow. every single town, I know, every single town has their own court. Every single court has their own prosecutor. Uh, every single court has their own judge. And it's up to the lawyer to speak to that prosecutor and find out the tolerances and their policies regarding um, these different types of cases, the drug uh, DWIs, the alcohol DWIs. The, uh, the DWIs that involve blood tests and urine tests are also very unique and to some extent are difficult for prosecutors to prosecute cases that involve DWIs mm -hmm. where a blood sample has been taken. And that, you need to speak to the prosecutor of each and every town that you practice in to find out what their unique policies may be. Huh. Yeah, they would make it uh, radically different than versus dealing with the same prosecutor and the same judge over and over and over. Well, that also happens. You know, you, you get you get cases in the same towns over and over again, and you get to know those prosecutors and their policies, those judges. More importantly, those judges and what their policies are as far as plea bargaining. New Jersey doesn't really permit plea bargaining on DWI cases, but you get to understand their tolerances for the minimums and the maximum sentences, and also what the prosecutor is able, is able to do with regard to with the case itself, disposing of it. And okay. then, of course, when you're going to try a case, who's experienced and who's not. Okay. okay. Um, so let's say, uh, you know, someone's been driving, they've had, <clears throat> I don't know, one or more drinks, and they're in the process of literally being pulled over. Do you have any tips on what they should or shouldn't do to help themselves? Yes. This might be somewhat state specific, but let's just talk in general terms. One thing you want to do is you want to make it as easy for the police officer as possible. Not to arrest you, but to, but to try to get the police officer in and out as quickly as possible. Okay. So, without making any uh, quick movements, you want to be able to provide to the police officer quickly your, your credentials, your license, your insurance card, and um, of course your registration. And in order to do that, you could try to have that available to them as soon as they reach the, your window. Okay. Um, the only proviso to that, or the caveat to that, is you don't want to necessarily make quick movements while the officer in making quick movements in the car, because uh, they might misinterpret that that you're trying to put something away or hide something. Right. If you're reaching over to the glove box, they may think that you're trying to hide something. Uh, so what you might want to do when the police officer arrives at your window is to say, here's my license, I have this in my wallet, my registration insurance card in my glove box, do you have any problem with me reaching over? Politeness goes a very long way with uh, the way a uh, case starts. Okay. Narrowly, police officers will appreciate that because one of the most uh, misunderstood things about police work is one of the most dangerous things about police work is when they approach a car. Mm. They're very, very vulnerable. So you can make that one of least of their problems by having your hands where you, they can see them and having your credentials ready for them as soon as they're there. They will process your matter with much more ease and much more relaxed. Okay, that makes sense. What kinds of help can you or have you provided to... Uh, you know, people arrested for DWI, can you maybe reduce jail time or fines or classes or initial interlock requirements? What kinds of things in particular can you do? Sure. I think that's probably what everybody wants to know when they are picking up the phone or emailing a lawyer. What, 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 can, they, what can they expect from the lawyer? Mm. Uh, what, what, what I provide, quite frankly, is, is, is a number of things. First, education, as we talked about earlier in the day. Uh, and second, 
secondly, to try to minimize uh, whatever penalties may occur. First, in, the, the first approach would be to try to get the case dismissed. Right. Or to try the case and try to get a not guilty verdict. Short of that, if we're not going to have a trial, we try to, uh, in New York, try to re- get it reduced to uh, driving while ability is impaired, which is not a crime, a traffic infraction, which reduces your suspension time down to 90 days as opposed to six months. And it also reduces the fines. And it also eliminates the need for an interlock device. So that is a critical factor that everybody needs to understand. The lawyer can, in the law, minimize exposure by, uh, by someone who has been accused of this offense if they go about it the right way. Okay. Is there any way to gauge the level of success you've had in getting some or all of the elements of a case mitigated or reduced for people, you know, throughout your your history of doing so? It's hard to quantify that uh, by numbers or by a track record. What I will say is that we try to provide quality service, provide quality legal representation, which allows people to understand what they're doing before they do it, ask the questions they need answered, to make sure they make an informed decision. So the the level of success is really in the client being satisfied that they've made the right decision, whether that be to go to trial or to take a reduced plea, or whatever this position might come out of it. What what kinds of um, mistakes have you seen commonly in people that choose to defend themselves versus have a, a you know a DWI lawyer? Well, you don't, you don't see a lot of self-representation in New York. You do see some in New Jersey. Um, the common mistake is simply having yourself as a client. Um, these cases are scientific. These cases are quite complex. And there's a lot of consequences to being found guilty or pleading guilty to a, a DWI or a DUI both New York and New Jersey. So the biggest mistake is simply thinking that you could handle this. Mm. Uh, you save a little bit of money on a lawyer, which is going to cost you a lot of aggravation and money in the future. So I would say the first mistake is actually doing it yourself. Mm. This is not one of those things where you should do it yourself. Okay. Um, is there a particular story that you keep hearing over and over and over from people that come to see you, you know, such as well, I only had two drinks, or, or things like that. Yes, that, that, that's actually the story. It's funny that you should say it that way. Um, uh, a lot of people simply say, oh, I only had a few drinks, and it was many, many hours before I started driving. How could I be responsible for a charge of driving while intoxicated, DWI or DUI? And that is a theme. Um, one of the layers of that theme is that sometimes that's simply not true. Right. They're not being totally frank with you to start with, and we need to break that down later on in our relationship uh, as I represent them. And the other times, it simply is exactly true. And what it has to do with is metabolism. Um, people metabolize alcohol differently. Mm. And there's nothing that metabolizes liquor more than activity. Coffee doesn't do it. People think that they, they drink a cup of coffee before they leave the restaurant and they've had half a bottle of wine, that they'll be fine. The truth of the matter is time to be put into your metabolism actually is the only way to bring your blood alcohol level down. So simply okay. having two drinks and not eating might be a, a, might cause you to have a high reading. Okay. When people come to you, the primary emotions that you're, you're getting from them is obviously they're very scared they feel like their life's over um, and then I guess what you, you know what you were saying is that you empower them because you're educating them maybe you're giving them like a, a guideline about what's going to happen or a roadmap is there is there anything else that you do that you see oh okay the person's relaxing the person's doing better or the person's getting through this is there anything else that that you do that helps them along to get through the whole process yes I do I bring them into the process instead of them looking at themselves being charged with it. I bring them in. I make them help me 
I make them part of the process so that they can see that the information that they provide to me is going to be used to help them resolve their case. And okay. all of a sudden, they switch from being scared and nervous to being helpful and hopeful. Huh. Okay, that's very interesting. Very interesting. I guess, all right, so to change direction, um, do you feel like the current punishments in both New York and New Jersey are too harsh? Or are they too lax? And why do you feel like that? Well, DWIs and DUIs are serious problems in, in all over the United States. And um, recently, over the last five years or so, they lowered the legal limit from 0 0.10 to 0 0.08. Okay. Um, so it's hard for me to say whether or not um, the penalties are too high or too low. What I will say is that people who uh, do get uh, arrested or charged with a DUI or DWI in New York or New Jersey are facing a serious consequence um, for their case. They should seek competent counsel, and it's it's the, the state of the law that provides for those penalties are not going to get any easier. It's going to become more and more harsh over the years, only because there are such dire consequences to people who are driving uh, under the influence. So what I would suggest is. Uh, that we really can't debate so much what the penalties are, whether they're too harsh or not, but to simply deal with each case one at a time and to try to mitigate the damage to each and every individual that's charged. Okay. And do you see the number of offenders going up or down in light of the penalties continuing to harshen? Well, what I do see is that because of the lowering of the legal limit from a .10 to a .08, there's more and more cases. What I do see is the uh, more and more cases due to checkpoints that are in different municipalities. So while the statistics uh, speak for themselves, I think there's an increase in DWI cases. However, on the other side of it, there are people who are becoming more educated about the consequences and are trying to go with designated drivers and taking the train and the bus and things like that. But I think in the long run, unfortunately, uh, the statistics are going up. You know, what makes you and your firm unique in providing uh, you know, DUI or DWI defense, and what statement do you want to make to potential clients that will watch your video and, and decide whether to hire you? I'm glad you asked, Richard. One of the things that we provide is uh, really boutique service, one-on-one -on -one consultations. Uh, you're going to know what lawyer is going to be going to court for you every single time. You're going to know what to expect when you go to court every single time. You know, you're going to know that we're going to be there on time. You're going to know what to expect when you go to court instead of all this nervousness and apprehension and anxiousness. That's what makes the firm that I'm with, uh, the law officer Carl Spector, unique. You're getting me. Okay. Um, and that's, that's really what I want to impart to people. Okay. Well, thanks for taking the time to do the interview. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Richard. It was really a pleasure uh, speaking with you today. Thanks a lot.